Hello everyone. Welcome to the first webinar in 12D's 2017 training webinar series. My name is Lisa Stewart and I'm the Marketing and Communications Coordinator at 12D Solutions. We hope you enjoyed our 2016 series as much as we did and that you're looking forward to catching all the exciting topics on offer in 2017. 12D's training webinars showcase common industry challenges, taking a close look at industry best practices and how these can be implemented using 12D model software. The aim of these webinars is to upskill 12D model users and broaden their understanding of the capabilities of 12D model. We run these webinars regularly and record them for posting through our website and on YouTube. The 15 webinars from the 2016 training series, as well as the 19 webinars from our 2016 Industry Solutions series, are available on YouTube if you missed those. During this presentation, you'll be able to type your questions along the way, as shown on the screen, and we'll answer as many as possible throughout the webinar. At the end, I'll also read out some of your questions to the presenter for his insights if there's time. Today's webinar, 12D Track Part 1, will be presented by Alastair McCrudden, who first started using 12D model, or rather 4D model as it was known then, in 1996. From 1997, he ran 12D training courses through a reseller, and then in 1998, he commenced contracting directly to 12D and has run our WA support and training ever since. Alastair's vast rail experience includes heavy rail in northwestern Australia and Africa, port facilities relating to rail and ports interface, and passenger rail, the Perth Underground and lots of rural rail network upgrades. He is loath to be called an expert in this subject, but we certainly think the term is apt. In this webinar, we'll look at how to calculate the centre of a track of surveyed rails using the Calc Centerline tool, use linear and arc regression to get a line of best fit to develop an alignment, calculate and plot slews, output slew diagrams and reports and spreadsheets, produce a rail profile, create and edit turnout sets, and place and edit turnouts. Over to you, Alistair. First of all, where do the tools live? You go up to design, track, you then have a sub-menu there, track tools, which I'll pull up there. Also, there there's some um, options on plotting and on labeling. You can get the same options from the view toolbars. You type TR, it'll take you down to track. Tick the track option down there. Finish on that panel, and I'm going to grab the toolbar and just put it up in the top of my screen up here. Now, I've already loaded my data in, so you can see that I've got a general set of data in here with typical topo survey, and included in that, I have got my rails running along here, so the two internal grey strings are the rails themselves. Then I've got the bottom of ballast on the left, top of ballast on the left, top of ballast on the right, bottom of ballast on the right, and as you can see the changes are increasing from left to right, so that is the direction of our rail line. If I now go across to a separate view here, where I've just purely got the, the rails themselves and the changes in there, if I then go and toggle on the vertices for this view, you'll notice that we've got these vertices coming in and the survey along this set of rails has been picked up at approximately 20 meter centers and we then have a series of cords that are positioning the left and right rails and what we're going to try and do now is to go and calculate the center line of those rails. So to do that we're going to use the calc center line which is an option either here on the pull down menu or alternatively if you go to your toolbar for the track stuff it is here so here's the tool panel come up into here in this case we're going to choose the left string which of course is going to be the upper of the two strings here as in the changes are increasing from left to right so I'll go and pick that select the string go and pick the right rail string select that in this particular case, both of those strings have got the same name, so that's not a problem. It'll see its way around that. We're then going to be producing um, a few models here, which are going to have the model for the centerline points. That's going to be a string which calculates the center of down each of the half distance between the two points. 
I'm going to change the name from track. I'm going to put this in as main line center line. I'm then going to go and do a copy and paste of that from there. Put it down into the DTM. So it's going to create a digital terrain model based on our points. The track left rail, what that will be doing is that will be giving us some cross sections cut off the level of the left rail points and then the track right rail which again we're changing to the, the main line that'll give us a series of, of sections cut off the height of the right rail that means that as we're going around corners and can comes into play we will have a, a variation in the height of those cross sections we're then going to go and hit the process button down here if i then go and add my four new models on in here you can see them sitting up there. I'm for the time being only going to go and put my main line on. You can see that's now gone and taken the center of each of those points. If I then go and add on the left rail cut, there are a se series of red cross sections. Notice that the cross sections aren't cut perpendicular to the center line, but they are cut through the nearest adjacent points here so they are skewed relative to the points that were picked up and then of course if I go and put on my right rail cut we then get some blue strings which sit over the top of or underneath depending upon which was the high high track and which was the low track of the two of them. So now that we've got those and our digital terrain model in there those are basically just cuts through there which we which can use a DTM later on. So now that we've got our center line in there what we're going to do is we're going to go and rationalize that by using a tool that is not actually part of the track set. What we're going to be using linear regressions and arc regressions to go and produce points that will give us a bit line of best fit or arc of best fit through our chosen points. Now, of course, if you had the design data for that particular track, then you wouldn't have bothered going through probably doing the center line um, string that we've just produced down here or alternatively you wouldn't bother doing the linear regression that we're about to do and arc regression because you would just use that original base data to produce it. So these tools really are to reproduce a railway line over an existing set of survey. Now the regressions that we're going to do with our track here are going to be linear and arc the important thing to understand about them is that they are going to be done as partial regressions. So if we go to strings, utilities, go down to linear regression here. We do have the three different types, linear, circle and arc. We'll start off with the linear option. And what we're going to do is we're going to go and pick on this partial button down here. I'm going to fill in the panel and then we'll go and have a quick look at something else. So the name that I'm going to put in here for the new regressed string is going to be straight number one. We'll put into a model called regression strings. And I'm going to go and give it a color. We'll use magenta nice and bright and stands out on the screen well for us. And then if I give it a report file, basically what that'll do is it'll come back and give me the amount of um, deviation that we had from the string. I'm not going to bother using it in this particular case. But what I wanted to show you is that because we're using partial regressions, it's very important where we pick the points that we want to do regression through. So let's just have a look at this. What I've got here is a bit of the uh, track training notes just showing the poor example of a selection for straights in a particular case here. You can see that if I go and pick a point up here as my first point on the regression and then a point down here on the straight for my end of regression, because we're starting off in an arc, the line that we're going to get is actually not going to be a very good fit at all. So that's a very poor selection of, of the points. Whereas down here, what we actually have is we have got a point at the start here, which is on the straight, and a point at the end, which is on the straight, and we get a very good regression. So always pick points shorter 
and make sure you get them truly on the straight rather than partially into a transition. So now we'll actually go and pick the points we want to put our straight or linear regression through. You'll notice that we need to be careful in that we've got a transition coming in here, so there's a slight bit of curvature there, and up the top here as well we've got the same thing, we've got a transition there, so there's a bit of curvature. So we're going to go in and start picking the points. So we come down here, we pick on the pick button here, and if you have a look down here just below my um, option down here, it's asking me to go and the first pick I do is actually to say, right, I have chosen the line that I worked on, and you'll notice that the, the um, prompt area is now saying pick the first point. So be aware, the first point is to select the string you want to work on, the second point is going to be the first point you want to pick as part of your regression. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to go and pick this point here, which is at around about uh, 4,200 and something. And then I'm coming up here to this point up just short of the 4,240. I'll pick that point in there. Then having that's three picks I've made now for that regression go and add my new model which is the regression strings and you can see it's gone and put in a little regression string in there for me. So now we're going to go and do a an arc regression. Of course you go through and probably do all your straights first and figure out where they are and then come back and look at your arc regressions. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to come up I'm going to go and change this and say we're going to use an arc That'll give us a partial arc, whereas a circle will fill the whole circle in. So in here we're going to call this arc number one. We'll still keep it in our regression strings. I might decide to go and change the color. And what I quite commonly do is if I've got compound curves, so one's going to follow on from another, then I will change the color of each of those curves as they go through there. So looking at this, we've got a curve coming in here and there's going to be a um, transition somewhere in here as well. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to go and choose the pick button. Remember the first pick is to go and select the string that I want to work on. So I go and pick my center line string there. It's now saying where's my first clip point. So I'm going to go and pick the point at the very start of the arc. And then I'm going to come around to this point here which is around about uh, 4110 that I believe is still quite safely on the curve in other words not into the, into the transition hit regression on that and what that's done is that's gone and produced a string that looks like that I can then say that I want to keep it that long I can go and edit the string itself I can go choose the extend option pick that point there drag it back if I want to make it shorter or longer. If it had produced the wrong part of the curve for me, for instance, on the side here, it might have gone and done the lower portion. I could use the same option there. Just do a save and quit on that. And that's produced my first arc regression string. So as I said, you'd work your way through the job, producing each of the straights and arcs, and then would come back in and build the alignment with element design. For this sort of work it would be just about impossible to use IP based design because we have compound curves which are a nightmare to try and work out in IPs therefore it would definitely have to be the element based design that we would use. Now once you've developed your center line off the surveyed rails and then gone through and using the super alignment string in the element mode to build your true center line, which gives you real geometry, both horizontally and vertically. The next thing is we may want to check the slew from the surveyed rail to what we assume is, is a reasonable design on our alignment string. So we'll then use the tools either from your menu option here, slew diagram here, or alternatively from your track toolbar, which is the one up the top here, and this is the slew diagram here. So in order to run the slew, what I'm now going to do is go and switch on my alignment that I've produced. So in this view now I have, if I zoom in here, you'll see that I've got the 
surveyed center line, which is the yellow string in a center line style there. And I've now got my developed super alignment, which is using real geometry rather than the chords, as we discussed in the previous video. So I'm going to go and give this a function name. So I'm going to call it RS01 MLDN SLU. So that's standing for reference string 01 main line down and the SLU option. So I'm now going to go and pick on the surveyed center line. So that'll be the 3D string that was produced from the calc center line option. I'm then going to go and choose my design alignment string, which is developed off those. When I do that, it auto fills in the start change, the end change, the number of vertices and so on. Um, there is an option there to do slew and meters, which I would certainly not recommend using. And then if we hit the recalc slew and go and do a fit on that, we then get this little diagram coming up in the slew area here. Now, in a moment, I'll go through the, the navigation tools up here. But just a general rundown to it, first of all. Zero in our graph here is running down the center there, and zero is where center line of both the surveyed and the uh, developed string would be identical. And then in a moment when we zoom in, we'll see that we've got negative and positive values here. So the red line is the center line as it the slew occurs based on those two strings. Up here on the top of the screen, we have got the curves on the right-hand side of the track. And down here on the bottom, we've got the curves on the left-hand side of the track. Now, in order to have a look at these um, navigation tools, first of all, the pick option is basically just puts it, if you like, in neutral gear so that nothing, none of the other tools are working. Fit is the same as any other fit in 12D. It says fit the data to the view. The rest of these tools work slightly differently though from the normal 12D. So for instance, if I come down here and I go and pick the zoom window, I can come in, pick a start point and an end point, And as I pick that, it immediately fills that view for me. So there's no need to pick that third option of which view you want it to happen in, because obviously it doesn't, doesn't work in this case. This is a graph. The next thing is a pan. So if I'm happy to stay in that, at that zoom scale, my pan, I do one pick on that, pick once, drag my cursor, and pick again. So that's a pick and release, drag, pick. Pick and release, drag, pick. And it'll stay panning until such time as I change to a different mode. We're going to do that now. The different mode I'm going to go to is this zoom in and out. And again, this works differently from other 12D icons. I pick on that. I come and pick a point somewhere, pick and release. As I then move my cursor left to right, it expands or shrinks in the horizontal. And if I move my cursor up and down, it expands or shrinks in the vertical. So if I just keep on zooming in there, you can see that what we've actually got happening here is we have got our settings in here where the string that we have developed off the surveyed string is giving me an amount of slew off each of these points. So 17 millimeters, 10 millimeters, 851. There's your zero line running along through there. And everything to the one side is to the left and to the other side is the right. And so there we have the amount of slew that we have on each of those options. Right, so if I now go into the plot strings, what we can then do is we can develop a model of the plotted strings, which we can see on the screen. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say I want to do a plot of the slew offsets. So the name I'll give it is I'll call it RS01 MLDN slew offsets. I'll use that same name 
copy and paste it down into the model. Color of white will be fine, and I'll leave a scale factor of, say, one in there. Now I'm going to come across here, and I'm going to go and do the plot profile. So I'll go and pick on that. I'm going to go and steal that same name again, except this time, instead of it being slew offsets, it's going to be slew profile. So I'll just retype that. And I'll go and copy that down into there, the red, and I'll give a distance offset of one there as well. We do have a description of each of the options down here as to what they're going to do. If I now come back and pick on the recalc slew here, that should then run through and I should have some new models up in here that I can go and add on. And I'm going to go and put in the RS01 mainline down slew offsets. And this is now showing me in millimeters the slew that I have pull this panel out of the way. You can see the slew that I've got to the left and the right hand side of the string so it's actually showing me where I've ended up in relation to the original survey with my new design string. So here it has pushed the string over by 28 millimeters at this particular point so that will be your 28 millimeters from there to there. Now that we've had a look at those slews in the view, we might actually wish to go and produce a report of those in one of two different formats. There's a simple method we can use, which is not one of the uh, track tools. If you go to report and then go down to the crossfall offset, you can then go and pick two strings in there and you get the chainage off the reference string. The first string is going to report on the second string that's going to report on. Most commonly, those two would be the same string. And then start and end chain it to the interval you want it to report on. And basically, it'll go through and give you uh, changes, coordinates, and offsets, both horizontally and vertically, in that report format, um, which is going to be useful for you. I'm not going to use that at the moment, as it's not part of the standard track tools. Instead of that, we're going to come over to here to the Export tab on our SLU panel and choose a spreadsheet template. This is a standard file that's shipped with 12D. It lives in your library, so you should be able to go and find that anytime you want to. That's the template file that we're going to use. I'll then give my file name, which again is going to be the RS01MLDN uh, for the reference string 01 main line down, and I'll put the SLU name after that. Come in here, pick on the export now. That will fire up Excel in the background. Then what I can do is come in, choose to browse my file, which is this one here. Double click on that. Select read. And that data will now start to be read in giving me the point number, the chainage, surveyed easting, northing, and RL, design easting, northing, and RL, the slew offset, the track lift at each point, bursine radius, etc., etc. And on the right hand side of the screen, there is actually showing a little diagram of how far things are to the left and the right. We're going to be looking at importing a rail profile. This can be done in a couple of different ways. You could either import a PDF of the rail, and provided that PDF had vector data stored in it, you can just use that straight away. Alternatively, you'd have to trace over the top of it. The second method to do that would be to import a 12DA file, which is what we're going to do here. So I'm going to go up to the File, Data Import, 12D, 12D Archive. I'm going to go to my user library, which I've got stored as a configuration on this particular job. And I'm going to come down and pick my rail 60 kilogram 12DA file and then pick on the read button. I then do a swap to my data import view. There is the shape of the rail. And if I go and toggle on my grid, you'll see that the 00 is the top 
riding edge of the rail on the inside edge of the rail profile. This is critical and if you have either imported the data in a different method and or traced over it and your data is not at zero zero for that leading edge there then you'd need to make sure that you put that to zero zero and scale the, the size of the rail correctly so that it will be in the right place when you go and extrude these rails along your job. So now that we've read that data in we can then go and save that away by going from the rail tools from the plot rail profiles create we're going to come up into here we're going to type in here the type of rail we want is going to be a UIC 60 the height above rail sleeper is going to be 0 0.17 we're going to go across to the load plot string tab. We're going to go and pick on the rail profile string, select the string that we've just imported, accept that, and then pick on the load data button. What that's done for us is it's given us here a graph, XY and radius, etc. in the table. In the diagram here we can see the shape of the rail that's come in there and then we've already had a look at the load plot string across to the file IO we can then go and write that data out if we had done it we could have read it and directly from there if it was already saved as a profile and we could then go into here and write that out as a UIC 60 rail and write that out for use in, in another project if we so wished. Once that's all done, we'll pick on Apply and a Finish. So now that we've got a rail profile, we're going to go and create a turnout. And the example one that we're going to use here is going to be a 1 and 16 swing nose crossing on a narrow gauge. On my training notes, we've got a bit of geometry for this particular crossing. The geometry dimensions etc would normally be supplied by the manufacturer of the particular turnout set so they will vary dependent upon that manufacturer and these can't be used as standard but these just give us a basic idea of what it's going to look like when we create the turnout and when we actually get around to placing the turnout in a little while you'll notice that the turnout itself is actually going to be placed as a function the beauty of that means that if the alignment is changed horizontally or vertically once the turnout has been positioned all we need to do is rerun the function and that will adjust the position of that turnout horizontally and vertically to create the turnout we're actually going to go either from the main menu option here of create and edit turnout You'll notice that there are four different variations that we can do with our turnouts and those of course are duplicated up here so we've got the turnout read turnout write turnout create edit which we're about to use there and then the place turnout so when we bring up the turnout create edit here is our tool we're going to start off by putting in the type of turnout that we want so this is going to be a ng narrow gauge I'm going to put an underscore in there then we're going to go to 1 in 16 again an underscore s n x underscore conk so we'll be putting it on concrete sleepers the configuration that we're going to have is going to be a basic configuration and then the label that this will appear in our listing as is going to be a 1 in 16 s n x on conk Now that we've filled in the turnout settings type 
configuration and label, we'll go across to the switch design tab. On the switch design tab, what we're going to put in here is the switch straight length. And in this particular instance, it's going to be 6.1 meters. That's all we're filling in there. We'll move across to the crossing design tab. On the crossing design tab, we're going to go and fill in the use crossing number here. So that's going to be a 16 as we're going 1 and 16. Once we press enter there, you'll notice that down here it's gone and filled in the 1 and 16 and given us the angle of crossing. If you want to, you can put in, instead of using the crossing number, you could put in the crossing angle. You just need to be aware that if you were entering that, that would go in as a degrees, minutes and seconds format. So 3 degrees, 2 minutes, 2 seconds, not decimal degrees. From there we can then go across to the closure design. And in here, we're going to go and set the gauge. This is a narrow gauge, so we're coming down and choosing our 1067. The radius of this particular turnout is going to be a 500 meter radius. It's got a lead length of 34.624 meters. The extra toe length is going to be 2.555. The extra heel length is going to be 14.6 and then we can come down here and choose our UIC 60 rail. Once we've read all of those in, we can go and pick on the apply button here. If we then go back to the turnout details, there is a diagram of the actual turnout itself as I showed from the training notes. Over here on the sleeper details, it can be quite a challenge to create the sleepers as there's each individual sleeper's location and length needs to be put in manually. So it's not something you, you would do very often. You'd set it up once and then run with that particular set once you knew it was correct. Now I do have an example one in my data set with the training. So I'm just gonna show you what that looks like. If I come out here to my turnouts read and I go and read in the example 1 and 16 turnout with concrete sleepers, read that in. If I then go and have a look at my 1 and 16 with sleepers, there is the format of the sleepers. So you've got the name, the type of sleeper it is, the material the width, the depth, the offset for the start and finish, etc., and end and so on. And that then is built for each sleeper right the way through the turnout. So as I said, not really a task that you want to do all that often. Now that we've produced our turnout, we've produced a 1 in 16 turnout, we're going to look at placing that turnout on our job. So what I've got showing here is I've got my main line running along through here, and I've got a passing loop line coming in and connecting in through here. I've used different super alignment styles on these two strings so that they've got different colors and can be seen a little bit more simply. For our turnouts, we saw earlier on that we've got the four different options in there from our main menu. We're going to be using the place in a moment. I'm going to go and select my option from the 12D toolbar up here. That brings out the turnout place panel. Commonly what would happen with the function name would be that we would give it a line it's associated with and the type of turnout. So in this case, I'm actually just going to call it turnout 1, 1 in 16. Turnout name, I'll go and copy that down and paste it in for the turnout name. The turnout type, rather than picking on the icon here, there's a little glitch in there at the moment, I come into the actual field itself, do a left mouse button, pick in there, and then I can go and choose my 1 in 16 
from the pop down list. When it comes to the placement node, we've got a few different options in here. So the front end would be the very beginning of the turnout assembly. The TOS is the toe of switch, it is the beginning of the moving parts. TPC main, that would be the theoretical point of crossing on the main or through line. TPC loop would be the theoretical point of crossing on the secondary line. K main would be the intersection point of the tracks center lines based on the chainage of the main line. The K loop would be the intersection point of the track center lines the chainage based on the secondary line. Back main would be the very end of the assembly based on the main line and back loop would be the very end of the assembly based on the secondary line. I'm going to choose to use the toe of switch option here. Then whether you want the turnout to go to the left or the right in this case, we're going to be going to the right. The center lines model, I'm going to call that turn out 1CL. The tangents color I will leave as white, and the center line color I will leave as cyan. We're now going to go across to the reference geometry tab. And in here, we're going to set the reference type now. These are fairly commonly seen anytime we're using uh, computators or, or element design. Uh, probably the mo most common ones that you'd use in there would be your vertex segment number at chainage or a dropped point. We're going to use the segment vertex segment number there. The reference string is going to be the through line. So that's our main line down. The direction is going to be normal. In other words, the split for the turnout will be in a forward direction. When we go and put the second one in at the other end of our passing loop, it'll be in the reverse direction, backward direction, so that it actually points back towards us. We're going to go to vertex number three here. So what that's saying is that it's going to be on this tangent point here. If I just zoom back a little bit, you'll see that there's our first vertex there. Our second vertex is here, so our third vertex is the beginning of the straight along here. Uh, we could then also do some minor adjustments on the um, offsets, heights, etc., and adjustment of angles. But basically, what we're going to be doing is putting it into this position here, and we're going to have a chainage offset of 15 meters. So that means that we're going to choose that point, but we're going to start 15 meters further down, which should be just where our second alignment starts here. So it's going to place the toe switch at that point. Now we'll go across onto the plot rails tab. We're going to go and I'm just going to go and call this turnout one rails. As I said normally you'd have longer names in there but then they're not going to show up in my dialog box here just at the moment. So we'll use the turnout one rails as the model name, we'll use our viz steel with an offset height of zero. We're not going to bother plotting the sleepers in this case here. If we wanted to, we could tick that option there and it'll plot the sleepers for us. And the other option that's left on those tabs there is to use a 12DA file. So you could, instead of reading in the turnout from our set turnouts we produced, we could read in a 12DA of that data set. So now that we've done all of those, we're going to go down to here, pick on the place turnout option, and then we can go and add some new models in here where we should have the turnout center line. I'll just do them one, by, one at a time each. So we've got our turnout center line string that's coming through there. There's a Y in there. Then we'll go to our turnout one rails, and there are the actual rails themselves for that particular turnout. So that's completed our first turnout. Now, of course, we could just reuse this panel 
and put new details in it. I'm just going to go and close it by hitting on the finish button, reminding you that we can actually go and place that by coming up to our icons up here. That is the panel that we wanted to use. We'll pull it down to here. We do have an existing function in there now of turnout 1 and 16. We're going to produce a new one. I'm going to call it turnout 2, 1 in 16. Remember I said to you before, we probably put the name of the rail uh, line in there as well. As it's a function, when we press enter, it's gone down and filled in the details down through here for me. So we've got a turnout name. The turnout type that we're going to choose is again going to be our 1 in 16. Remember that you need to pick inside this field, not on the button. We're going to have our placement again here as the toe switch. This time we're going to have the turnout to the left hand side because it's going to be the mirror image of this one that we've just produced. I'm just going to go and strip out that 1 and 16 from there just to keep that name a little bit shorter so we can see the full name there is turnout to center line. Keep the colors the same. Over onto the reference geometry here. And again, we're going to use a segment. The reference string is going to be the same reference string, so it's going to be our through line. This time, we're actually producing this at the other end of the loop down here. So our vertex index is going to actually be part 14. That'll be the 14th element in there. And last time we used a an, an offset here of positive 15. This time we're going to use a negative 15. And what that's going to do is it's going to take it from this point here, which is vertex 14, and it's going to step it back so that the toe of switch actually starts here. And of course, this time we want the turnout to go in the opposite direction, so this will be reversed. We're not going to bother with uh, the sleepers, but we will plot the rails. That's all okay in there, and all I'm going to do is just strip out that 1 in 16 again, just so we can see that a little bit easier in there. And then we're going to hit the place turnout button there come up to our plus sign again and add those models on. Again, I'll do them one by one so you can see them as they come in. We've got our turnout to center line. So there's the center line happening in there. Our turnout to rails. And when we zoom in, that's placed our second turnout. Now remember that these turnouts are functions. So if the horizontal and or vertical geometry of the alignments changes, those turnouts will adjust horizontally and vertically again to match those center lines. Thanks, Alistair. Now, I think we've just got time for maybe one question before we finish. So, Mark in Brisbane has asked, uh, what happens to the turnout if the alignment changes? Good question, Mark. Um, when because this is a, a, a function, if each turnout that you place is a function, it means that that is a link to the geometry of the string. So if you go and move either horizontally and or vertically the alignment string, all you have to do is recalc the function, and it'll then adjust the horizontal and vertical to match in to the new alignment, both horizontally and vertically, and uh, or should always sweet from there. Perfect. Thanks, Alistair. And thanks to our audience for your questions. I think um, most of them were dealt with either live um, with typing or um, just then. But if there were any we didn't get to live today, we'll answer you by email later. The recording of this webinar will be available in coming days through our website and our YouTube channel. Our next two training webinars will be 12D Design Fundamentals, Introduction to the MTF on the 2nd of February and 12D Track Part 2 on the 9th of February. So do see our website for details of those and the rest we've got planned.
We'll also continue to keep you posted through email and social media. If you need to contact us in the meantime, our details are on the screen now. That concludes our presentation for today. Thank you for attending and we hope to see you at future webinars.